Since 2010, Caroline Lucas has been the Green Party's sole MP in the UK. Last month, she announced that she won't be restanding at the next general election, and so the Greens are looking for a new candidate for her constituency of Brighton Pavilion. Three people have put their names forward so far, and I'm hoping to interview all of them. I'm going to be joined by one of them today. But before I introduce them, I have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by Sean Berry. Sean, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. So let's kick off nice and straightforwardly with why are you seeking to be the Greens parliamentary candidate for Brighton Pavilion? Well, I think this is an enormous challenge for our party. We absolutely need to be making sure that there are Greens in the next parliament. Um, we don't know exactly who the government's going to be, but if it's a Labour government, I just think Greens are going to be needed more than ever. Um, and we're all sad that Caroline's leaving. She leaves behind this enormous legacy. Um, Brighton Pavilion is an incredibly special place to have put Caroline into Parliament um, since 2010. It shows some really amazing things about the city. It shows that they're, they're independently minded all the way through all those elections since 2010. And if you think about the different circumstances of every single one of those elections, they've consistently said, we want to make sure there's a green voice in Parliament. We value Caroline's input into the whole parliamentary process. And we just, I just think we, we owe them the best possible candidate to continue that legacy. And I hope that people will choose me to do that. I hope that, that my record um, and the fact that I'm you know, putting myself forwards and committing myself to the campaign will make them choose me to, to join their team. So obviously, lots of our viewers will be very familiar with you already, Sean, um, because of your previous roles as co-leader of the Green Party and also because you're a member of the London Assembly. Now, a lot of our viewers will be wondering, um, given that you are so closely associated with London, uh, with three London mayoral bids behind you, with your stint in the London Assembly being a councillor and so on, why is that you're seeking this constituency in Brighton? Well, I think there's there's two things that the the candidate needs to bring to this to this election. Um, one of them is you know the ability to be a really really good local MP. Um, at the moment, I've got a record of being a, a local councillor for for nine years since 2014. Um, I've got 8,000 constituents there. Um, I've also been a London Assembly member for seven years, and and in London, I'm a London wide Assembly member, which means I have. 9 million constituents. <laughs> so this job is somewhere in between and there's different kinds of casework um, and local issues that get raised and ways in which you take up the issues. But I think that my work on the London Assembly is, is very transferable into Parliament. What I often do as part of my work is like, you know, I see my inbox, I see the issues that people are bringing to me from across um, different boroughs in London and I will recognise that this signifies there's a problem somewhere in the system and I'll take issues up to the mayoral level and quite often to the government level to try and fix the system. Um, things like the estate residents who are facing demolition. Um, one thing I said might help to fix the fact that lots of people were being not listened to, having their homes demolished from under them for these big regeneration schemes that didn't deliver net gains in social housing. I, I listened to them, I worked with them and their groups. I took a proposal to the mayor, which he initially wasn't interested in, that they should have a ballot and a final say on any proposals. And through campaigning, through working with people, I got that thing changed. And I think being an MP would involve, you know, listening to people on the ground in your constituency and being a green in a, in hopefully a group of greens, um, would involve listening to people as issues coming from other constituencies that they represent as well, and taking those up into parliament to fix the system. And I've got a record of doing that. Um, and I think that that's what people in Brian Fillion want to see. But also there's some of the things that Caroline's done that really just helped the local area, things like getting the, um, the Gatwick Express trains to stop again at Preston Park Station. Those kinds of issues are things that I do take up around London as well on behalf of my constituents, things that that are local issues as well. So I think I think I've shown I've got all the skills to do that job. Um, I think it's really important that people voting now in the Brighton Pavilion selection, who are the members of Brighton and Hove Green Party, bear in mind that this is a local role, but it is also a national role. And that the, the, the ability to take local issues and not just represent them individually, but recognise they're part of a pattern and take them up 
into um, Parliament is, is a really important role as well. So I want to talk a little bit in a moment about the sort of campaign for the Brighton Pavilion constituency, but just sticking on on that last question for a moment, if, if that's OK. Um, so you're currently first on the list for the next London Assembly elections. If you're selected for Brighton Pavilion for the general election seat, will you be staying first on the list for the London Assembly elections? I do. I plan to continue my job here for as long as it until I've got another job, basically. Um, and I think that is the right thing to do. Again, I think people in Bright Pavilion need to see and, and see demonstrated not only that I'll be there on the ground and I do plan to be in Bright Pavilion whenever I'm not required in London in person um, and that is something I've committed to absolutely do to knock on every door to knock once to listen to knock another time to persuade to make sure that people know that I am there on the ground but I think also continuing the job in London of making change happen and representing people, showing I can do the job and make a difference is an important part of convincing people to, to back me as well. So I'll, I'll continue doing that until till I, till I have another job. So let's talk about the campaign then. So what do you think that you can bring to make sure that the Green Party can hold Brighton Pavilion with you as the candidate? So um, I don't want to talk in public about our campaign tactics because I know that Labour are probably going to try and take this seat away um they do not like working with the greens they probably do not relish the idea of having um someone in parliament and a group of greens in parliament challenging them um while they're going back on things like today Keir Starmer on the today program talking about free school meals it was utterly pathetic um, the very idea that this is something that we just can't afford to do when it would make such a difference to all the class issues that they're actually highlighting. Absolute nonsense. They're handing us, you know, a bunch of other things like like rent controls, things that that really matter to people in Brighton Pavilion. I know the, the rents there are are almost at, at London levels and the incomes aren't as high either. So the problems as acute for people in that constituency as well. Labour do not want there to be Greens challenging them on their backtracking on good, important social justice issues like that. So they're going to try and try and win. Um, and I think it is important that we don't just give away all our tactics. But um, but yeah, I'm going to be there on the ground. The, the thing the thing that you can say about me is that I'm not from Brighton. I'm I'm not. That is a that is a fact. And if you were to go out on the doorstep by the time of the election as a Labour canvasser and say Sean's not from Brighton Pavilion, I am determined that every single one of those canvassers will get the answer back. Well, I've met her. I know she's here. I know she's working in the community because I've seen her doing it. And if we can crack that one, then then we've got this. And I think my record as a as a national politician, as someone making change on the ground is really strong. And that is a very strong thing that, that they won't be able to compete with, I think. And so the backdrop for the next general election in Bright Pavilion is last or rather this year's local council elections in Brighton Hove. Um, which you'll be very familiar with. Uh, and uh, for the Green Party, it was quite a um, a dark day in terms of Brighton Hove elections. So uh, for viewers watching who aren't aware, essentially going into the elections, the Greens were running the council as a minority administration. Uh, the Greens lost a substantial number of seats following the election and Labour won an overall majority. What lessons do you think that the Greens need to learn uh, in order to maximise the chances of keeping hold of Brighton Pavilion from those local election results? So they, they were really sad election results in lots of ways. Um, they weren't as bad as they looked in some cases in that you know, the green vote was still very strong. It went up in, in the ward where we were facing um, conservative incumbents. That was a really positive thing about that election. And some of the losses that we faced, you know, the councillors that we lost by a tiny, tiny vote, one vote in one case, um, so things are very, very close and we're starting from a very good place. If you think about this um, compared with 2010, we are we are in a, you know, a very solid position. Um, but it is, you know, it is sad that we we lost the, the council um, administration. It's important to remember that we took over that administration because the previous Labour minority administration collapsed in the middle of the pandemic. The challenge that those Greens took on, the courage that they showed, um, I think he's still appreciated by a lot of people in Brighton and Hove, despite the negative campaigning. So, we, we, you know, we're starting from where we're starting. Uh, we recognise it's a huge challenge, but 
I, I love a good challenge. I love I love a challenge where you know you've got this goal that looks um, you know very very high, very very big challenge for you to to try and um, achieve. But the steps along the way are there, and you can start taking those steps straight away. And I and what I've been doing since I've I've been in uh, Brighton and Hove is talking to as many people as I can who are the councillors, who are the former councillors, who are candidates who are hoping to be councillors, the executive members, key activists who do the door knocking to see what they think about about where we're at. And people are more buoyed up than than you might think. And I think we're, we're already gaining in enthusiasm in just a few weeks since what was really disappointing. So let's move on then to talk about what I think is probably quite a big um, issue for members who are going to be voting in this election which is I guess the the political priorities and the politics of the person that they're going to be hopefully sending to parliament um so to start off um if you're selected for Brighton Pavilion and ultimately become an MP what would your political priorities be once you're elected oh um well I mean I, obviously I bring with me um a number of issues that I'm really really passionate about those include housing, which I've already talked about. Um, renters' rights is something that I think the Labour government need a strong, will need a very strong challenge on. Um, lots of evidence bringing, lots of campaigning with the community. But I wouldn't want to preempt too much what I'm going to be working on, because that has to be led by listening to people. So um, obviously where Labour fail, I want to be speaking up, um, whether that's on, you know, oil and gas, on insulation, on, on free school meals, on drug reform. You know, they're terrible on lots of things that are really strong green priorities. But I think the point of knocking on doors first to listen is to find out what it is that, that Brighton Pavilion voters want from their MP. And given that they've wanted Caroline Lucas so hard for so long, um, I'm hoping those will be issues that I'm very, very keen to work on. Um, I feel really, like I said, I've been there for a few weeks now, um, living there, um, speaking to people, going going to every single ward, um, and I yeah, I'm just really feeling at home there. So I'm hoping that our values will be very aligned when it comes to choosing issues to work on in Parliament. And so I thought it'd be useful in these interviews to talk about some of the issues that have been slightly contentious within the Green Party because they're issues that people voting will want to know where the candidates stand on. Uh, so the first issue I wanted to talk to you about is HS2, which has obviously been a conversation that's been happening in the Green Party over the last few years as to what the party's position should be on that. Where do you stand on HS2? I mean, I've always hated that particular project. I love, and this is disappointing because I love High Speed Rail. I worked for years for Campaign for Better Transport and they they were very similar in their kind of um, line on this. You know, we need more higher speed rail links between cities, um, particularly between the cities in the north. It was really positive that the government were coming forward with the plan. Um, but this plan has been bad from the start. You know, a lot of the ways it's been, the, the route was planned, the, the stations, a lot, of, a lot of it is wrong. Um, but where we are is where we are. You know, they've, they've half built it in the borough where I live the borough where I'm a councillor in Camden they there is currently a big hole in the middle of our borough they've demolished housing they've rebuilt quite a lot of it but there's still quite a lot of housing in limbo there's a big hole right through the middle of the um the borough and and when you go on the rail rail line that runs alongside that route you can see the diggers that haven't moved in months. They're just sitting there doing nothing. There's an enormous amount of land that needs, if they're not proceeding with it, they need to restore it and turn it into meanwhile space. So, so where I am is, is they need to restore what they've done to, to the centre of London. Um, and my view is they ought to look at what they can do with what they've already done um, in terms of infrastructure and, and along that route to see if there is use that can be made of that in the meantime because it's just it's very disappointing that they've they've sunk this much money into it and they're just now going to 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 leave it in limbo that's I mean you know we are where we are now another area that's been controversial has been uh NATO so viewers watching um may or may not be aware but the Green Party very recently at a spring conference changed its stance on NATO. So prior to that conference, the party's position was that uh, that the party supported British withdrawal from NATO. The party's new position is that they want to, that the party wants to see continued NATO membership with a series of reforms as part of it. Where do you stand on that policy position? 
Well, that's not quite that's not quite how I would characterize it. And I understand completely why we were opposed to NATO and had in our policy to withdraw, because, you know, it is it is not healthy to have countries who are seeking to create a more peaceful world lined up in opposition to each other along um, you know, multilateral lines, but not through the United Nations, which was set up for this purpose. Um, so yeah, I, I can I get why we are a policy a party that is opposed to NATO. And obviously it's a nuclear alliance as well, and we are party of disarmament. But also I understand why having a policy that implied we were going to withdraw the UK from NATO on day one as soon as we had a, a casting vote in government was was problematic as well. So the policy we have now says here are some reforms and they are much more, they are quite anti-nuclear reforms. They are more about um, doing more in negotiation and, and less sort of posturing. Um, if we can't get those reforms, the policy very clearly says we'll look at other security arrangements for the UK. So it's it's a it's a more pragmatic policy. Um, it makes sense to, to phrase things in those ways, but it's not pro-NATO. Um, the, the rest of our policy is very clear that we prefer the UN, um, the, um, the European peace building organisations to NATO in terms of how we would do peace building. You've obviously been a very vocal supporter of trans rights, um, but many people watching will understand and know that there's been a persistent problem of transphobia within the Green Party. If you are selected for the um, Brighton Pavilion candidacy, you'll be one of the most high profile Greens in the country. If you're elected as an MP, you'll be even more so. How would you use your platform to stand up for trans rights and to advocate for tackling transphobia within the party? I mean, I would absolutely, you you know, you know my 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 views on this. I've got, you know, again, I've I've got a real issue of conscience. I cannot vote for anything that that doesn't align with my support for 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 trans rights, for non-binary rights, for for all of the different ways in which people want to express themselves. I think there's just an absolute human rights issue there that that is a conscience issue for me. Absolutely 100 percent Um I don't think it's the I don't think it's the, the party's MPs role to be involved in party discipline. I think it's our job to lead from the front to show um, the, the the right way to behave. Um, it is there is a there is a part of the code of conduct that does allow for criticism of other party members. But it's really clear that that you you should there should be a high bar for that, that things should not be done so much in public. And it isn't, I think, the, the MP's job to do those sorts of things that I perhaps I was doing as leader but yeah I mean you know I'm not I'm not never going to compromise on that um you're not going to make me say anything that that isn't fully in support of trans rights so I promise to move on to the slightly less serious questions which I always like to end on um the first of which is and everyone always tells me this is a serious question but I don't think it's that serious uh what is your favorite and least favorite Green Party policy um, uh, citizens income UBI drew me into the party it remains my favorite transformative policy both for reducing people's carbon footprint um, but also for, for increasing their ability to thrive it's just a really inspiring all-round policy I, I we, we remain committed to it and it's just such a great policy um, least favorite policy I mean like I say, I'm I'm pretty supportive of, of, of almost everything that, that's in the uh, PFSS. If I name one, it's just a niggle, really. If you look at our policy, actually, you'll be interested in this. Um, if you look at our policy on post offices, it's not really one. It what you, it looks it's it's just a bit of a leftover bullet point, and you can tell from the grammar that it's leftover from when we had a policy that was firmly opposing privatisation, but it isn't really a positive policy about post offices and um you know mail services and 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 all of that and it my work on dead spaces on on making sure that there are spaces in communities for for people to to access services and all of that I just think there's room to have that policy improved and I keep thinking I'm it's probably my fault actually I keep thinking I'm, I ought to do something and I never have um because time and all of that but I think that policy isn't quite worthy of us and needs sorting out there's nothing wrong with it it's just it's just very brief and doesn't really say anything 
did nothing less than to hear a very niche specific line of policy from you, Sean. So. No, it's not wrong. It's just, you know. Yeah. Uh, my second of these less serious questions is uh, what book has most informed your politics? Oh, oh, my goodness. I should have I should really have looked at that. Um, there's a book of Bernard. Uh, Bertrand Russell essays that starts with In Praise of Idleness, which is amazing and is again about basically about UBI if effectively. Um, that's worth a read. But then it follows on with a really good essay called something like social questions in architecture which sounds boring but it's about co-living um and it's about um the benefits of having more communal um resources around um where you live um and potentially sharing things like dining halls and things like that and I'm, I'm quite into co-living and that's a very inspiring essay as well so I think that kind of that book it, it, you know there's lots of other things in there as well that I'm a humanist obviously he's a he's a big humanist so yeah Bertrand Russell in general there you go. Excellent shout out for Bertram Russell. Um, so two final questions. Uh, the penultimate is, which politician from another party do you most enjoy working with? Oh, oh, that's a really tricky question. Um, I mean, part of being elected under PR in the Assembly means that um, Labour here have to work with us a lot more um, than usual. Um, and I've had some really productive bits of work with Labour actually over the years. I mean, Tom Copley was an assembly member and now is the deputy mayor for housing and residential development. Um, but while he was an assembly member, we were we were very aligned on stuff and he's very into um, land value tax as well. Um, and it's a bit of a shame now that he is now the deputy mayor and a lot more defensive and doesn't always do what I say, which is a shame. So my final question, which I've almost definitely asked you before, is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? I mean, who, who could say anything other than Caroline Lucas? Sorry, that's just obvious. Like, why, 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 why? I mean, she's been amazing um, to me throughout my whole career. She's she's genuinely the first time I became principal speaker, which is back in 2006. It was Caroline and Jenny who sat me down in a coffee shop and went, We'd like you to stand for principal speaker. Um, and it's been like that, you know, all the way through. She's she's the, the the ask her to stand is very much Caroline's motto. And she does it. I'm sure she does it with other people as well. She's she's really great. Um, she isn't just, you know, a figure on the TV that you admire. She's she's a good colleague. Sean, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. So that was the second of my interviews with the candidates for the Brighton Pavilion selection. You can go back and watch the interview I did with Emily O'Brien, who is one of the other candidates, and I'm hoping to get an interview with Daniel Rue, the third and final candidate, too. I have a few final things to say just before I let you all leave. The first of them is please, please, please do hit subscribe. It's the best way to make sure you don't miss out on any of the videos we put out in the future. Please also let us know what you thought of the interview in the comments down below. And if you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate so that we can continue to put out videos, interviews like this and all of the rest of the content that Bright Green does. So that's it for today. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.